Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. That's a, I love that song. Love that song. Well, um, let me pray because I need Jesus and so do you. God, I just thank you for every single person in this audience right now. And I thank you for, um, I thank you for the words that are about to come out of my mouth over the next um, 35, 40 minutes. And I pray that you would just speak through me, that I would be your vessel, that this would be an act of worship from me to you, God, that, um, that everyone here would be able to have ears to hear. Any ears that are closed, I open them now in the name of Jesus. And I say that they would be able to hear. That's one of the most important phrases in the Bible that Jesus says over and over again, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So this morning, I pray that ears are opened, that ears are open. They're opening in the physical sense. I'm asking you that you open them in the spiritual sense as well. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can take a seat. Thank you so much. It's always such a privilege to preach here at Soho, our original um, OG community. Um, and it's so good to see that you're growing and flourishing, and so much is going so well here. And um, um, I just love, love this community. I love to be here, and it's an honor and a privilege to be on Paul and Andy's pr- platform, but as well as Stephen Ramos platform this morning. Um, I just, I really love being here. So, thanks. Love you too. Love you too, Steve. Thank you, Lincoln. So much love on the front row. Anybody else? Just want to <laughs> throw it out? Feeling the love right now? My parents? My dad raised his hand, and my mom was like, oh. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm definitely the favorite child, so I'm not insecure about that at all. <laughs> Trust me. All right, so <laughs> I'm going to present you with a problem today, um, and we're going to try and solve it. We're going to try and solve a problem today, and my problem is that sometimes I feel like the gospel, the good news, when I read my Bible, when I go through all the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I read about what Jesus did, what Jesus spoke, what Jesus was really on about in his life. I read all those things, and first of all, I try to do them, and I find it very difficult to do them. Has anyone read the Sermon on the Mount? Yes. Most people probably read the Sermon on the Mount or at least heard someone preach on it, Um, It's Jesus' first, like, real dissertation, his almost announcing of the kingdom. So he comes in, he heals a bunch of people, he shows people the kingdom first, heals people, sees demons cast out, sees blind eyes open, sees lepers completely healed, sees paralyzed people start to walk, and then he tells them about what that kingdom actually looks like in the Sermon on the Mount. So it's kind of a show and tell, right? And what I find is that even in his opening phrases, the, what we call the Beatitudes. I don't know why we call them that. I don't know where it came from. That's not really what Jesus was getting at. It's like, just have a good attitude. <laughs> I'm like, that's what I think every time I read it. I'm like, that doesn't really make any sense. But if you read through the Beatitudes, and you're just a normal person, just reading those without any context, without anything behind it, and you read the Beatitudes, you might think Christianity is pretty miserable. Am I right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. (laughs) So far, um, to be a Christian, poor and mourning all the time doesn't sound like the type of life that I necessarily want to live. I'm like, okay, Jesus, like I saw the miracles you did. I saw that cool stuff you're doing. I'm kind of caught off guard by the beginning of the Beatitudes. And the problem that we have is that we can't work those principles into our daily life. My question and my problem that I continually run into is, does the gospel really work? Does it really work? Does it work in your day-to-day life? Is there any good news for your day-to-day life or are you just buying, not buying, but are you getting a free ticket to heaven? Because if you're just getting a free ticket to heaven, if you're just, you know, raising your hand, saying your prayer while all eyes are closed and heads are bowed because we don't want to embarrass anybody, (laughs) But then Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me right after. That's kind of a shocking moment for people. When you first pray that prayer and you're like, we don't want anyone to see. And then, oh, by the way, to follow Jesus. (laughs) But the reality is, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if it's just a ticket to heaven, why not just check out now? Why not just call it a wash, man? Like the world is falling apart. Like, especially if you watch the news, I find that people that watch the news think the world is falling much more apart than it actually is. 
And we find that we walk through our daily life, our relationships with our husband or wife or our significant other, or just our daily friendships or paying our bills or um, just having normal conversations or traveling or finance or work relationships, whatever it is. Does the gospel actually work in those scenarios? Does the good news actually work in those scenarios? Because I would beg the question that a lot of times, a lot of times, we will go through life day to day and we'll live a life where we don't actually really need the Holy Spirit at all to get it done. We don't. You can go through your day life. Like, let's be honest, guys. I do this all the time. I'm a pastor. Like, just to put everyone at ease, there have been days where I've gone to work as a pastor that's supposed to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, and I've done an entire day of work and finished that day of work and not needed the power of Jesus at all to accomplish what I accomplished. Are you terrified yet? Like, everyone's like, well, he's the pastor of Union Square, not Soho. So, so let's just let them have it. <laughs> let them have this guy. <laughs> Come to Union Square at night and we'll question whether the gospel works. <laughs> but I want it to work for daily life, and we all desperately want it to work every single day. Because if the good news is just going to heaven, then it is not good news at all. It's not good news. It's really not good news if it doesn't work today and right now. And I think it's silly for us as Christians, and I don't know where it happened over the last 2,000 years, for us to really believe that we have a faith in a God of the universe, and he dies, raises again, sends the Holy Spirit to empower us to do his work, and then says, well, really all that's just like a ticket for when you die and go to heaven. First of all, kind of boring and frustrating and irritating, and you wonder, why don't people like buy into this Christianity thing? Because we're not presenting a face that shows people that heaven is now. And heaven is real. And heaven is present. So we have a problem that we need a question, we need to ask about consistently every single day. Is the gospel working in my daily life? Is the gospel working in my daily life? And why don't these principles work? Why can't I just apply these principles as a band-aid and why doesn't it all work? Because we're going to walk through a process of what actually happened, what happened that made us search for something that we can't seem to really put our finger on, and every single person on the face of the earth knows that this is a problem, that they try and add all these principles, they try their New Year's resolutions, they try and change all these things about their life and around their life and the things that they do, and they're wondering, why isn't this good enough yet? And you feel in your heart and you know in your mind that it's not good enough. Let me illustrate really quickly. Have you ever tried to get somewhere by not going somewhere? So I moved here from New York, or from California to New York, and everyone's asking me where I'm moving. So I pack up a van, I put a bunch of stuff into the van. And I'm about to drive cross country with my dad. The Great Plains are not that great, people. It's like some of the worst. I was excited to see like a loose dog when I was driving through there. <laughs> but he was like, oh, look at that, something alive. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, but if my friends are asking me while I'm in LA, while I'm in Orange County, they're like, where are you going? Oh, I'm not going to that Denver. No, where, no, where are you moving? Well, I'm not, I'm not even going near that, that city, Denver. That's a horrible place, that Denver. Parker, wh where are you moving? Well, I'm not going to Denver. <laughs> not going there. Where do you think I would end up? Pretty much nowhere. <laughs> Everyone thinks it's like, oh, that's a trick question. He's going to say Denver. <laughs> no, pretty much nowhere. I might possibly end up in Denver, but mostly nowhere and mostly immobilized with fear and not really knowing. I just need to stay away from Denver. That's all I know. I could end up in Canada. I could end up in Australia. I could end up somewhere, but not where I'm actually trying to go. And a lot of us treat our Christianity like that. I'm going to stop looking at this website. I'm going to stop hanging out with these people. I'm going to stop having just one too many drinks. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to stop doing that. And you're trying, you're not going anywhere, and you're not getting anywhere because you're trying to get somewhere by not going somewhere. It makes no sense. And we, we tell people that's the gospel. 
here's some good news for you. Don't do that. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't sound very good to me. Does it sound good to you? Now, I know something is missing, and this is what's different about following Christ than any religion or anything. It's not a list of rules and regulations, first of all, but it actually creates an internal change. And that is the heart of the gospel, and we're going to unpack this a little bit this morning. It starts in Genesis 2, 4 through 7. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. So imagine this. God decrees all of creation. You can leave that scripture up there. That's good. We'll read that in a second. God decrees all of creation into existence. He creates light first before there's sun and the moon, by the way. So he creates the whole idea of light, which I think is pretty cool. He made that up. <laughs> and speaks the animals into existence, speaks the waters into existence, separates land and earth, creates the atmosphere, adds form to the earth with his decree, like a king should, like a king of the universe does. Now, what happens here? Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. It's a lot different than a decree of creation, isn't it? It's a very personal intimate moment. And when Adam goes, <sighs> for the first time, he's staring into the face of Almighty God. And the relationship starts the moment he takes his first breath. He didn't say, man, become. He could have, if he wanted to. He, he can do whatever he wants, really. He can do whatever he wants right now. But he decided to start the entire thing with relationship and giving him life from the very start. Is that cool? So God's first intent, his first intention with mankind is relationship. His very first intention is a relational being. So God creates Adam and breathes life into his lungs, literal life into his lungs. Genesis 2, 15 through 22. Now the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden and to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For those of you that have heard this story before, I think everyone's heard the story of Adam and Eve and think the knowledge of tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, always a tongue twister for me for some reason. But what does that even mean? It basically means that man, the, the danger is that man would choose what he believes is right and what he believes is evil. That doesn't really work. He makes himself God, and he chooses what's good and what's evil. It's not just knowledge of knowing what's good and knowing what's evil, like, oh, I know what evil is now. That's cool. No, it's man deciding and taking into his own hands what good and evil are. But you can only have one of the two trees. You can only have fruit from the tree of life, which God breathed into Adam in the first place, or fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What man tried to do and is trying to do throughout all of history is decide what's good and what's evil but not knowing who they actually are and who they actually came from, which is the substance of all the things that are truly good. We'll move on. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Death itself is not something. It's an absence of the life of God. It's a drawing away. It's not like, oh, death is a thing. It is the absence of a thing. It's not a created thing. It's the absence of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord had formed out of the ground the wild animals, all the birds of the sky. So he brought them to man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. Cool responsibility. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and the wild animals. So God brings Adam to this point in his own mind. God doesn't tell Adam straight off the bat that Adam is alone. In one way, he's alone. He's got God, the creator, with him. He's got God, his friend, with him. But he realizes, Adam, in this moment, realizes there's nobody like him. There's nobody like him around. So Adam's sitting there like, okay, I've named all these animals, but a suitable helper has not been found. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. 
you got to realize this is the first stuff, time this stuff happened. You know what I mean? Like imagine falling asleep and God removing a rib from you. And the Lord God made a woman from the rib and taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. Like that's just a wild scenario. Like just think about, just think about how crazy that whole scenario actually is. That God created a whole other being while you were sleeping and he wakes up to this thing. And in, in, in turn, here comes the first love song. Which, gave, which should give all men a lot of courage in their poetry, poetry because this is horrible. So <laughs> it's the first thing you say to the first created woman ever, right? It's definitely not Shakespeare. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And then he names her. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why man leaves his father and mother, and he's united with his wife, and they became one flesh. Adam and Eve were both naked, and they felt no shame. So what we have here in this moment is the perfect family. Do you ever wonder why you know your mom and dad are imperfect? Why you expected more of them? Why you expected more of your siblings? Because there's an ideal. There is an ideal in every single person's heart for the perfect family. It's hidden in our hearts, and we don't know why it hurts us so much when imperfect human beings fail us. We can't figure out why it's such like a, a, a disastrous effect when mom and dad don't do something right or don't do anything at all or everything in between or our siblings torment us or whatever it might be. We can't really figure out what's going on because there was a perfect family. And the union between God and this perfect family is what made it perfect. They knew where they came from and they knew whose image they were made in. So why isn't anything enough? Why isn't the prestige enough? Why isn't the acclaim from our peers? Why isn't even family on earth enough? Why aren't that group of friends that know how to laugh and have fun with you and spend time together, why isn't that enough? Why is there still always something missing from the gospel just working? I mean, some of these things are good in the right context, but we're still missing something because we've forgotten who we are. We've forgotten who we belong to. And let us return then to the gospel or the good news. But the gospel, the good news is better than a returning. It's better than what Adam and Eve have and what they had. And let's walk through that together this morning. If you're writing down a title for this message, I know some of you may have already taken notes. The title of this message is Son of Man. Son of man comes back to Jesus. Does anyone know what Jesus' favorite title for himself was? I won't give it away. It's a secret. <laughs> Say it. Son of man. Now, if you were the king of the universe, would you come to earth and call yourself the son of man? No. No, you wouldn't. Be honest. Come on now. King of the universe, maybe, as a start. Like, hey, you doing, guys? If I was a baby, I would definitely start talking as a baby and just, like, slip that one in there <laughs> just so I could get lots of attention right off the bat or great one or almighty or powerful one or, you know, just bringing down fireballs from heaven just for fun, not to hurt anybody, but just, like, to, because he can. <laughs> just because he can. But what does he call himself? calls himself the son of man. Time and time again, Jesus calls himself the son of man, the son of man, the son of man. He repeats it over and over again because he's revealing something to us. He's telling us a secret. He's revealing to us his real mission, his true mission to bring his family back. And by equating himself with us, by calling himself the son of man, by calling himself by the name that one of us would call ourselves, he makes it possible to redeem all of mankind, all of mankind. Mark 12, 13 through 17. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. Now, to explain to you who the Pharisees and Herodians are, the Pharisees are basically the religious elite of the day or the pastors, I guess, of the day. 
And the Herodians would be like congressmen or senators, people that are kind of like running everything. These guys are in charge of everything. At this point, they're super jealous of Jesus because he's drawing crowds, doing miracles that they can't do, just doing a lot of things that are really frustrating and upturning the whole system that they've built, this power base that they've built. So they keep trying to catch him in arguments in front of his crowds, in front of his followers. So they came to him and said, teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity. <laughs> you aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. <laughs> I love that phrase. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. It is, is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? Now, the Romans at this time were the only ones that could actually bring the death penalty on someone. So they're trying to trap him in his words. So the Romans catch him. They realize that Jesus doesn't think Caesar is God, and they want to nail him to a cross. They're all trying to just trap him in this. And the only ones with the capability to actually kill somebody or propose even the death penalty at all would be the Roman consulate. So they're trying to upturn him and trying to trick him so he ends up getting killed. But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought the coin, and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Is anyone amazed at this statement? I wasn't for a really long time. I had, I had no idea what it actually meant. For years and years and years and years, I wasn't really amazed at this statement. It's like, Jesus, like, why are you slipping in, like, paying my taxes? Like, if I'm doing everything else, obviously I'm going to be a good tax-paying citizen. Like, it doesn't make any sense. I don't see how that helps me in my daily life. But you have to realize why he said what he said in the context of what he's saying around the Jews. The Jews understand what Jesus was saying in this moment. And there's a reason why, and we already went through part of that reason. Why would Caesar put his image on coins? So you knew when you were in his realm. In order to make a transaction, in order to make a transaction in his realm, you would have to have a Roman coin with his image printed on it. So anyone that came from any other territory or any other place would have to exchange the money they had and grab what the actual currency of the day and the time was in the realm of Caesar. Now, where does God put his image? On you. Where is God's realm? Every single place there is a human being on the face of the earth, an eternal human being. God's image is implanted on them, and that is his realm. So when we pray, the kingdom of heaven should come to earth, a lot of people, the English mind, thinks like of this big funnel system from heaven. Like, okay, like uh, he, God's up in the sky or beyond the universe in a different realm, and if I pray, kingdom of, the kingdom of heaven should come right now, like Jesus asked me to pray, and we should pray, then this funnel's going to open, this valve is going to open, and it's going to pour out on us, and then we're going to have heaven on earth. But the Jewish mind would understand that everything belongs to God. And they would consider earth the actual first heaven. And his rule and dominion exists here, and he places his image on it. Everything that is valuable to God is placed in the image of the human being, the son of man. And so the only way that we can be redeemed, the only way that we can be purchased back, the only way that we can be bought back is that for something perfectly valuable, not tarnished, not worn, not broken, can be paid for the price that is on our head and on our hearts for the mistakes that we've made. And that's when the gospel really starts to work. Because we realize that the price has been paid by Christ and that we no longer take our image or take what we need from money or from acclaim or from achieving or from our friends or from anything around us or the clothes that we wear. We take it from our family because we are no longer orphans and widows. We are sons and daughters. And the image of God is planted in us through Christ. Now, you have inherent value. The whole idea in society of equal souls before God comes from Christianity. A lot of people point to the Enlightenment and say, oh, that's where it came from. If Christianity didn't exist, equal souls and equal judgment before God would make no sense. We would switch to a system of survival of the fittest, which doesn't work for human well-being. 
The whole idea of equal souls, the whole idea of all things, all people are created before God equally. The whole idea of the Constitution comes from the base of Christianity. The whole world that we live in today is different because of what Jesus said 2,000 years ago. Because of the Imago Dei, because the image of God is planted on you. And that's why human beings are important and valuable. And that's why I love cities like New York, because everywhere you go, you see God's dominion in the faces of the humans around you. (laughs) Come on now, that's awesome stuff. That's good. Everywhere around you is God's dominion. And the kingdom of heaven is not somewhere off in the sky. The kingdom of heaven is very present and very real, and the Holy Spirit is around us and in us and all-powerful. It's not something we need to reach for. It's something that's been given to us. And that's what a son or daughter does. That's the difference with your identity now. See, you are trying to change. You're trying to lay laws upon yourself. You're trying to change yourself by rules, trying to get somewhere by not going somewhere. But where we're going is sonship, is daughtership, is being a son or a daughter of a king. A son or daughter of a king doesn't say, please, God, can I have some more? A son or daughter of the king says, I'll take that and I'll make this place better. I'll take that and I'll make this place better. I don't have to ask to look in my parents' fridge. Some of you have a fridge wide open in front of you, and you're looking at God going, can I take it? Can I take it? Can I take it? Can I take it? It's right in front of you. Grab it. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is not coming. The kingdom is here, and Jesus ushered in how to live in that kingdom. And the only way we can do things like living the Sermon on the Mount, the only way we can have the kingdom of heaven present on earth right here, right now, is if we change in transformation, not just try and change our behavior. Every other religion tries behavior modification. And it's unfair because some people have better discipline than others. Some people were raised in better families than others. What about the sinner? What about the broken person? What about the person that was abused or neglected? How can they get into the kingdom of heaven? That's why Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Those that don't know anything that's going on right now, those that don't have any clue about who I am, You're blessed because I'm here, and I'm bringing the kingdom whether you like it or not. Maybe it's not a list of things to do. Maybe it's something Jesus gives us. John 3, 3 through 15. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, now this is a weird answer for what Nicodemus just said. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus compliments him, and then he tells him he needs to be born again. Any of you have conversations like that at work? Someone throws you a compliment, great job on that report. Truly, truly, I tell you <laughs> that in order to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. I, okay. <laughs> what are you talking about? Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? It's an extremely horrible visual there for all of us. <laughs> Jesus answered, truly, truly, and really in um, the original Hebrew, when he would be speaking to Nicodemus, most likely in Hebrew, he would have said, amen, amen. Only a king says something is done before he actually makes the statement. So he's not just saying truly, truly, like he's saying, listen up, but he's saying it's already done. I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Holy Spirit, that's a capital S, is spirit. Do not be amazed at what I said to you. You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Now, we have to put ourselves in Nicodemus' shoes a little bit. This is super confusing. Like, let's be honest. Like, this is super confusing for someone that lives their day-to-day life. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. Like, if unless you have access to the Holy Spirit, unless you have access to what the Spirit is doing, it makes no sense. It makes no, no sense at all. 
And we all like kind of judge Nicodemus, but in the same environment, in the same moment, you'd be like, okay. Not really sure what to do with that. Not sure how to get my hands on that. Are you the teacher of Israel and still don't understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and we testify of what we have seen. And you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Now let's stop for a second. Heavenly. Everyone is thinking of the sky. Stop it. (laughs) When I think of heavenly things. When he says heaven, he means what's mine. Everything belongs to the king. This, our very present heaven, the kingdom of heaven is present because God rules it all. Little bit of a mind bender. And every time I've said that at every single community, people go, what? It's not some staircase you have to walk up. It's not something that's in the sweet by and by. It's not some far away thing that you're trying to access. You have access to the untold wealth of the creator of the universe. That's relational wealth. That's being loved beyond what you can possibly imagine. That is the death and the blood of his son to pay for propitiation for your sins. That is the renewal of a man being born again. See, a lot of us are trying really, really hard to be born. Do any of you remember how hard you tried to be born? Thank God we don't remember that moment, but the reality is you didn't work very hard to do that, did you? Your parents had some fun, and then you were born. Am I right? You're not like, well, walking around, you're like, these are my parents right here in the front. I don't walk around earth like in like some weird, not quite existing state yet, whatever you want to call it, and look at them and go, I'm going to be a part of this family, and then jump inside my mother's womb. Some of you are trying your Christianity like that and trying to change like that. I'm going to be born again. 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 How's that working out? It's exhausting. I'm tired. I'm tired of the gospel not working in my daily life. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of walking through my daily life and thinking, well, someday things will be better. Someday things are going to get good. Someday, you know, the kingdom of heaven will totally come and everything's going to be fine. We have the image of God on us and we carry the kingdom of heaven wherever we go. That is the difference between Christianity and every other religion. We know that we were made in the image of God and we're here in his domain bringing his rule and authority to bear on the earth that's trying to get away from him. But in the end has no chance because it belongs to him. And God wants his family back. And he will do anything to get it. And he has done everything to do so. See, we lost the breath of life. But the spirit making us reborn through the death of Jesus Christ changes fundamentally who we are. And why does, why does it change who we are? What changes? Our orientation for life completely changes. Steve, can you come up here for a second? I brought a rope. (laughs) Brian was scared at first because I had an intense look on my face when I brought it down. (laughs) All right, so take a look at this rope and imagine this rope as eternity. So the rope, a, a real geometric line goes on and on and on and on and on and on in both directions, right? Right, a little geometry lesson just quickly, that's fine. So just imagine it goes all the way out, all the way up the stairs and on and on and on and this is eternity. This is eternity. This is your life in the span of eternity. And here we are, like we're born, right? Like we're raised by our parents or whatever happened in there. And then we're like, oh, I'm going to go to college. I really need to go to college and get knowledge. And then I'm going to get an awesome job. I'm going sa- to save. We all need to save, right? We all tried that for New Year's resolution. Are you saving? How's that going? <laughs> Not very good. Saving is good, guys. And then we move on here. It's like, oh, you know what? I want to get married and have some kids. I'm going to have some kids. I got like a few kids here. I got like a beautiful house. You know what? New York is too hard. And I'm going to move to the suburbs and have like, <laughs> and have a, have a white picket fence and forget about all the community and what people have sewed into me over the years. And, um, <laughs> and then, and then, sorry, did I slip that in just now? <laughs> and if you don't, if you can't handle Rome, that's fine. Right, so... It's the Rome of the world. 
And then, you know, I'm going to retire now. I'm going to buy an RV, and this, I'm going to travel around the country because I've always wanted to travel around the country. Like, I've just always wanted to, like, have a really big, obscenely-sized vehicle. And, and that's how I'm going to work my way towards death. <laughs> and then it's over. People think I'm crazy because I invest in the white part. And I think you're crazy if you don't. But let's remember that the black part is still part of the rope. See, you're no longer defined. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> See, you're no longer defined by your past. You're no longer even defined by your present or your future. You're defined by eternity, seated with Christ in heavenly places. So we no longer live from a place of the flesh. We live from a place of being reborn in the spirit from heaven, and heaven is present among us. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So we are no longer defined by time. We are defined by eternity. It's a completely different way of living. It's like when John in the beginning of the gospel says, and Jesus came in truth and grace, right? Truth and grace. When the word truth is used there, it's actually... The original Greek is actually a higher reality or a higher realm or something higher or better or more real or more tangible than what you can see or feel or smell or taste or touch. He's talking about the kingdom. And the grace is the empowerment to actually live that out, is to live that out in that higher realm, that higher reality. He gives us the power to do so. So our whole life is transformed not because we try really hard. Our whole life is transformed because God births something brand new inside of us. It's not something switched. It's not something changed. It's not a human being modified. It's a brand new identity. Because you now identify with the king of the universe, not with money, not with talent, not with the things you have, not with your clothes, or not with a certain group of people. You identify with the king of the universe. And he is a father that loves you so much that he was willing to send the most valuable thing with the image of God planted on it in the heavenlies, his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. And he rose again so we could live empowered to bring his kingdom to earth, which is present and ready at all times whenever we're ready to open the fridge and just take something out of it. Stop trying to pull the kingdom down and start living like you're in it. Isn't that a little bit better? Isn't that a little bit more exciting than just living a life to die and go to heaven. I think it is. <laughs> I think it's a lot better. <laughs> I think it's a lot better than some, some, you know, far off land, some fantasy. It's here and now. Can we put the quote up on the screen if we have it from Dallas Willard, The Divine Conspiracy? I'm sorry, I'm skipping a scripture right now. Let's read this together. Does Jesus only enable me to make the cut when I die? Or to know what to protest or how to vote or agitate and organize? It is good to know that when I die, all will be well. But is there any good news for life? If I had to choose, I would rather have a car that runs than good, good insurance on one that doesn't. Can I not have both? Yes, we will die. And yes, we will go to heaven. But yes, the kingdom is here. Jesus wasn't announcing a kingdom that's going to come sometime. If the king shows up, it's here. And the king showed up, and the king set a model for us in how we live in a kingdom life. And he gives the Holy Spirit without measure in order to do so. So how does the Holy Spirit, how, how does the kingdom spread? How does this work for our daily life? How do we actually access this? How does this become a part of of everything that we do, not just church on Sunday and not just waiting to die, which is like the worst religion anyone has ever thought of. And some sects of Christianity are like that. They're like, oh, I'm just going to wait. I'm just going to wait to die. The kingdom is powerful and present to heal people and save them and pull them out of difficulty. And we say, well, it's going to be good someday. We have something much better. Because when Adam chose to step away, and Adam and Eve chose to step away from the family, they chose to make good and evil their own thing. 
they decided what good and evil actually was. They stepped away from a family, and they were separated from God. And the reality is that the problem took place when they were no longer orienting their lives around who God was. We have to remember that God walked in the garden with Adam. We have to remember that God was with him when he saw his bride for the first time. He was there when he took his first breath. He was with him all the time. So when God says at the end of that, that verse, where are you? When he asks Adam, where are you? He's not coming to hunt him down. He's not coming to punish him. He's probably wondering, we're always together. What's separated us? Why have you tried to clothe your own shame? Why have you tried to cover yourself? Your whole life revolves around me. I made you. And many of you are wondering, does God really care about me? What is God really thinking about me? Does the gospel actually work for my daily life? He knit you together in your mother's womb, and the reason it works in your daily life is because God values you, God renews us, and makes us brand new through his son. It doesn't work because we try really hard. It works because of his son. Go back up to this verse, John 16, 25 through 28, as the band comes. We're going to pray here in just a second. You'll notice that when Jesus finishes this verse in verse 14, sorry, further up, as Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So whoever believes in him will have eternal life. You'll notice here it doesn't say shall go to heaven. It doesn't say shall go to heaven. It says you'll have life now. You have eternal life right now. That is a world-changing thought. Trying to be better is not. But having eternal life now and access to the tree of life again and having access to Jesus, the tree of life who was hung on a tree and died for you. Having access to that life will change people. Knowing how much you're loved will change people. And showing people what their new image is in Christ will change the world. And it is your job in your workplaces, in your life, in your friendships, in your families, wherever you are, to bring that kingdom here and now. John 16, 25 through 28. We're going to wrap it up here. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but I will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I am not saying I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. He restored access as the second Adam. It was the first Adam that failed and the second Adam that was perfect that restored the family to everything it was supposed to be in the first place and then some. Because we don't know God just as creator. We don't know God just as maker. We know God as savior. We know God as friend. We know God as our love. We know God as the one who makes us new, that restores all things. And it's so much better. The gospel is so much better, and we just scratched the surface today. We just barely scratched the surface of the implications of the kingdom being ever-present in our daily lives. And I encourage you, I want you to take away one thing when you go home today. Remember, every single day and every single moment that the kingdom is available now. You don't have to usher it in. You don't have to bring it in. Jesus already did that. Access it. Open the fridge. Open dad's fridge and eat all you want. But even better, take what's in the fridge and give it to people. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you take what Jesus has in the kingdom and give it to people. And you can really see how the kingdom works.